Imagine, just imagine that an inadequate rich son breaks into your house, into your fortress who claims that he is taking your wife with him for a couple of nights. How would you react? In addition, he begins to openly threaten. I had thoughts of pouncing on him and boxing on his arrogant face, but I decided to act differently. I wasn't in the best mood as I concluded loading my tools into my pickup truck that Thursday afternoon. The client I had been working with for the past two weeks seemed indecisive about the staircase project. He continuously requested changes to the initial plan, and the latest modification, requested that morning, was so extensive that I had to dismantle a significant portion of the work I had already completed. Additionally, I had to consult with the architect and engineer because accommodating the client's latest whim required a redraw of the structural plans. As a result, the following day would unexpectedly be a day off. I'm Kenneth Morrison, the main artist and owner of a small woodworking carpentry shop specializing in designing and constructing high-end staircases. My clientele includes wealthy mansion owners, hotels, restaurants, and offices willing to pay well above $50,000 for an exclusive, artistic staircase. At 34, I had been married to Daphne Tupper, 29, for four years. Daphne was a successful lawyer at Kramer, Boylan, and Hendricks, a law firm specializing in commercial and intellectual property law. We hadn't started a family yet, mainly because Daphne wanted to establish her career first. Returning home at 4.30 p.m., I was surprised to see my wife's car in the driveway. Typically, she worked late on Thursdays to finish early on Fridays. Entering through the back door, my usual route after a day at a construction site, I discovered a slight water pressure issue. Wondering if Daphne was in the upstairs shower was unusual, as she typically showered either in the morning or before bedtime. After a quick change into house clothes, I headed upstairs to investigate why my wife was home so early on a Thursday afternoon. As I suspected, Daphne had recently finished showering and was now donning some alluring black fishnet stockings. A brand new black dress lay on the bed, patiently awaiting its turn to be worn. Hey, honey, why are you here so early? Am I forgetting something? Do we have plans tonight that slip my mind? I inquired. She regarded me with an expression I hadn't seen before, a touch of nervousness evident, though she made an effort to conceal it. Letting out a sigh, she replied, No, Kenneth, you haven't forgotten anything. I'm going out tonight, and you're not. I'll be away until Sunday afternoon, spending the weekend with Derek Kramer. What? What on earth are you talking about? Is it a business trip or something? I questioned. No, Kenneth, it's not a business trip. Derek has a hotel suite reserved for him and me. I'll be back with you next week, but this weekend is for him, she said, her tone defiant, though her words seemed rehearsed. No, you can't. I don't want my wife spending a weekend with another man. What is this nonsense? I protested. Well, you better accept it, Kenneth, because that's what Derek wants, and I advise you not to cross him, she chuckled. I see. You're willingly a part of this plan? You want me to just accept it, swallow my feelings, and let you go, and then you'll be my faithful wife again after this weekend? I retorted, sarcasm dripping from my words. I never said it's only for this weekend. Derek has mentioned he wants it to happen from time to time. So yes, deal with it and keep quiet. Trust me, your life will be much simpler if you go along with it, she declared. We'll see about that. I won't tolerate this, Daphne. You better think about what you're doing because I won't let that arrogant guy control my life. If you believe I'm a pawn, you can manipulate without any objection from me. You're in for a rude awakening, I warned. By then, she had finished preparing for the evening. I headed downstairs, grabbed a beer from the fridge, and noticed a Mercedes parking in front of the house. Mr. Smugness himself emerged, walked up to the front door, and rang the bell. Kenneth, that's Derek. Will you go answer the door? she yelled from upstairs. I hastily entered a code into the back door alarm panel, set up my cell phone for video recording, and placed it in my t-shirt pocket to capture everything. Then I waited in the living room. I had known Derek Kramer since the day Daphne started working for CBH three years ago. 
Our first encounter was at their office's Christmas party. Derek, a man in his forties, exuded a dominating attitude. He appeared chummy with his fellow partners, and flirtatious and smooth with female employees and the wives of male employees. However, in the presence of his male employees and the husbands of his female employees, his demeanor oused arrogance and contempt, I instantly disliked the guy. Daphne stormed down the stairs, visibly angry, and opened the door. I observed the scene from the living room, nursing my beer. I'm sorry for the delay, Derek. I don't know where my husband's manners are, she said, adopting a subservient demeanor. She lowered her voice to say something else to Derek, but I couldn't hear it from where I was. Hey, dusty boy, I hear you have an issue with Daphne spending the weekend with me, he thundered, resembling a school principal addressing a child as he entered the living room to confront me. I couldn't believe the audacity of this guy, thinking he was the boss in my own house. Hey, shithead, get out of my house or I'll call the cops, I declared, clenching my fists. He burst into laughter and Daphne smirked beside him. And what do you think the cops will do? Let me tell you, nothing. They won't do anything. You know why? Because, hey, are you filming me? You bastard. He had just noticed my cell phone. He grabbed it and attempted to stop the recording, but it was password locked. He threw it on the ceramic floor. Naturally, the ceramic emerged victorious in the clash. Listen to me, you clever individual. Your wife will be spending this weekend with me whether you like it or not. She'll be with me whenever I desire, and your opinion in this matter doesn't hold any weight. Do I make myself clear? If you attempt to interfere, you'll face consequences. Your life will become a living hell compared to what awaits you. So, you'll remain silent this weekend and refrain from causing any trouble. If I catch wind of you upsetting Daphne, threatening divorce, or engaging in any foolish actions like trying to contact my wife, everyone will learn about your questionable money laundering activities or the illegal materials with children supposedly on your computer. I opted to feign ignorance. It's highly improbable that such information would become public knowledge. I've never been involved in money laundering or had any connection to illegal materials with children, I mechanically replied. That can be easily arranged. Uploading material to your computer is a simple task. I possess content that could quickly ruin your reputation. I chose to play even more clueless. Illegal materials with children is illegal. If you upload some to my computer, doesn't that mean you're already in possession of illegal material? I asked innocently. That's the distinction between you and me. Some things that are illegal for you are perfectly acceptable for individuals of power, like myself, who have the right connections. I highly advise you to stick with your working class antics and not bother people of higher standing. Do you understand? I could scarcely believe what I had just heard. Such dialogue would be excessive even in a comedy movie yet the individual in my living room was speaking earnestly. Oh, and one more thing. Please refrain from seeking revenge against me or Daphne. That includes attempting to get back at her by engaging with someone else intimately. I want to avoid any potential transmission of infections from you to Daphne and then to me, okay? I won't ask Daphne to deny you sex, at least not for now. Can't you see I'm not being unreasonable? In essence, if you cross any boundaries, I'll be aware of it, all right? Now, let's go, honey. They returned to the front door. Daphne picked up her overnight bag and left without saying goodbye or acknowledging my presence. Honey. He referred to my wife as honey. The entire situation was so surreal that I couldn't muster pure anger. My emotions were a blend of anger and astonishment. At that very moment, I silently thanked the burglar who had broken into my house the year before. I met Daphne. I was so disturbed that I had a comprehensive surveillance and alarm system installed, complete with motion-activated cameras and voice-activated microphones that could record everything in the house and store it in the cloud. I never revealed to Daphne that the system could be set to recording mode while we were at home, ensuring she remained unaware when I activated it just before she opened the front door for that deplorable individual. Simultaneously, I had initiated the recording on my cell phone, serving more as a decoy. My expectation was that Kramer would notice it and figure out a way to turn it off. 
This would make him feel less guarded, and he might speak more freely, thinking he was no longer being filmed. I hoped this could be a valuable source of information for a potential divorce. The scoundrel provided me with much more than I anticipated. The cell phone now scattered on the floor was, in fact, my business cell phone. After dealing with a wealthier clientele, I quickly realized that providing them with my main cell phone meant being on call almost 24-7. A dedicated business cell phone allowed me to turn it off at the end of the day, and I could attend to messages the following morning. So at least I wasn't without a means of communication. I picked up my personal phone and called my business lawyer and best friend Harry. Ten years ago, Harry Davenport became the husband of my elder sister, Jennifer. They enjoyed a blissful marriage until tragedy struck. Four years into their union, Jennifer tragically drowned during a trip to Guadeloupe with her three friends. Despite the heartbreaking loss, Harry remained an integral part of our family, earning our love and respect. Three years after Jennifer's passing, Harry found love again in Christine. They tied the knot after a year of dating, and my parents, Daphne and I, were honored guests at their wedding. To this day, Harry and Christine are like siblings to me. Recently, I found myself in a dire situation and urgently sought Harry's assistance. After explaining the threats made by someone named Kramer and detailing the events that transpired during my wife's private weekend getaway, Harry immediately offered his support. He advised me to stay indoors, refrain from contacting anyone, and turn off all communication devices. Assuring me that he and Christine would be there in an hour with dinner, Harry's guidance provided a much-needed sense of security. Reflecting on the events of the past hour, I realized that Daphne, my wife, had been drawn to Kramer's power and charisma. Never did I imagine she would discard our love for him. It was a harsh awakening to the fact that our bond was not as strong as I had believed. My journey with Daphne began five years earlier at a birthday party for a friend of a friend. Though unfamiliar with most attendees, I struck up a conversation with Daphne, the sister of the birthday boy's army buddy stationed in Afghanistan. Our connection blossomed, leading to a week of dating and eventual marriage the following year. During that period, I remained employed by Mr. Duncan, the founder of the small company where I worked. Craig Duncan was highly skilled in woodworking and well-known in our local area. Despite his expertise in that field, his abilities in accounting and management were lacking. While still in college, he had hired me as a part-time accountant to handle his bookkeeping. A few months into my role, Mr. Duncan secured three sizable contracts that demanded more time than he could spare. Although these projects were challenging, his clients insisted he take them on. Consequently, he asked for my assistance in the field. Initially, my tasks involved running errands, procuring supplies, and providing support with the handling of large pieces. My rapid learning and aptitude for the work became evident, and after overcoming the initial learning curve, I could independently handle simpler tasks or be a valuable asset on more complex projects. While I obtained my accounting degree, my passion for hands-on work led me to pursue an apprenticeship. After a few years, I earned certification and became Mr. Duncan's associate. Upon his retirement, my parents supported me financially, enabling me to buy out his share over a two-year period. Although the lawyers at CBH viewed me as an uneducated shop worker, I was unfazed. My company thrived, focusing on fewer but more lucrative projects. Over the preceding months, I had hired two assistants, and my net income and value surpassed those of many lawyers associated with my wife. Despite this success, even my wife was unaware of these details. My contemplation was interrupted by Christine and Harry, who arrived with Chinese takeout and beer. Are you okay, Kenneth? Christine inquired, offering a warm hug. I can't believe Daphne did that to you. This is so unlike her. Harry, giving me a supportive hug, reassured, Don't worry, buddy. We'll sort things out. Let's have dinner, and then I'll take a look at your recording. I shared the details of Daphne's unwelcoming reception when I arrived home earlier that afternoon. 
Following dinner, I grabbed my laptop and retrieved the files containing recordings from both the camera and microphone. Thankfully, the conversations were exceptionally clear. I can't believe what I just heard, Harry exclaimed. Quite an arrogant fellow, huh? I remarked. No, more like a downright foolish one, Harry responded. I mean, this guy is what, 40, 42 years old? That should mean he has about 15 years of law practice under his belt. He's not a rookie. Yet, he's so full of himself that it never occurs to him that sometimes you just need to keep quiet. Your clever trick of making him think he wasn't being recorded after he destroyed your cell phone worked like a charm. He took the bait and spilled everything we need to know. Okay, but can I legally use it since it was recorded without his consent? I inquired. Absolutely. This is your home. You have the right to record whatever you want here, Harry reassured me. So, I have nothing to worry about. Is that what you're saying? I questioned. No, that's not what I'm saying. We need to be extremely cautious. I did some research on my way here. Chris was kind enough to drive and handle the takeout. It turns out our guy, Kramer, is the son of the founder of their law firm. You were aware of this, right? Harry explained, and I nodded. What you might not know is that his father, Marvin Kramer, had quite a reputation. He wasn't a great lawyer, but most of the judges in the area were his former college buddies. Knowing everyone personally made it easy for him to win most of his cases. Unfortunately, his son Derek has followed in his footsteps. That's what makes him dangerous. He has a wide network of friendly judges, and if he files a case, getting a judgment in our favor will be extremely challenging, no matter how illegal his actions are. Wow. So you're saying that no matter what I do, I'm in trouble? Not necessarily. Winning will be challenging, but not impossible. I have connections too, you know. The key is to gather enough evidence to make a strong case against him. I've got a plan. But you mentioned that the judges will always side with him, I inquired. Unless we take the case to criminal court, that's what we'll aim for. Our conversation was interrupted by a knock on the front door. A petite brunette was waiting on the porch. Hello, Mr. Morrison, she asked. Hi, Laura. Come on in. Harry called out behind me. Kenneth, meet Laura Foster. She's the computer specialist at the private investigator firm we collaborate with. I took the liberty of reaching out to her after our earlier call tonight. We briefed Laura on the situation and had her review the recorded conversation, particularly the part where Kramer threatened to upload incriminating material to my computer. Laura paid close attention and then outlined the plan. All right. There are two possible scenarios. Either they come here during the day, likely with your wife's assistance, sit at your computer, change the date, and upload their content, making it appear as if it was done before Kramer's visit. If that happens, your camera system will capture everything. Just ensure it's in record mode before you leave for work in the morning. She pulled a small gray box from her bag. The other option is remote access to your computer for their mischief. I'll install this module upstream of your modem to record anyone attempting to access your router and monitor what they try to upload or download. Take a few minutes to transfer all your personal or sensitive data and files onto a flash drive, then delete everything on your computer. The goal is to prevent them from accessing it. I'll assist with this, just to ensure you don't unintentionally leave any hidden data on the computer, Laura explained confidently. It was evident that she was well-versed in her field. Harry chimed in. Let's get started. Kenneth, currently your only evidence against him for blackmail is a recording. If you try to pursue legal action with just that, your case might be dismissed quickly. Public opinion doesn't see blackmail as a very serious crime, and the judges he knows may support him. The ideal scenario would be if Kramer actually uploaded illegal material to your computer and then reported it to the police, claiming he has evidence of you possessing illegal content. In that case, we would have a trail indicating that all of this occurred without your presence at the computer. 
With the advance warning you received from Kramer, which you recorded, we would have enough evidence to build a strong case against him in criminal court. His judge friends would be less likely to support him if he's involved in criminal activities, especially those related to illegal materials with children, and they would distance themselves from him. I find that disturbing and twisted, I remarked. Yes, but Kramer is just as twisted. One more thing, can you refrain from using your computer for the next few days? If Kramer proceeds with his plan and reports you, the police inspectors may want to check the computer records to confirm if anyone accessed the illegal files post-upload. If you avoid using it, the records will remain clean, which would be more advantageous for us. Also, ensure that your cell phone doesn't connect to your home Wi-Fi in the coming days to prevent them from using your phone instead of your computer. Laura installed the surveillance module and erased all sensitive information, including my company paperwork, from both my computer and cell phone. The module will forward us copies of all access requests. I'll reach out to Harry and you once we have some information. Best of luck, guys. Laura informed us before leaving. All right, let's get back to more practical matters, Harry suggested. Kenneth, do you want to start the divorce process now? Or do you prefer waiting until Daphne returns to see if things can be resolved? No! I want a divorce as soon as possible. I can't stay married to someone easily influenced and corrupted by self-proclaimed powerful men. No hesitation, I want out. All right then. I'll contact Claudia Milton tomorrow. She's the family law expert at my office. Good, fair, and efficient. I'll ask her to reach out to you ASAP. You'll like her. Harry assured me. We continued discussing matters, and I provided Harry with the access code to my recording system for real-time updates and cloud-stored information. Christine and Harry departed around 23 hour. I took a Zopi clone and fell asleep within half an hour. At 8.30, the following day, Claudia Milton called me after concluding a conversation with Harry, who had detailed the specifics of my situation. She requested my presence in her office by 11 sows. During our meeting, Claudia expressed sympathy for my predicament upon learning about Derek Kramer's questionable reputation. She reassured me that, since I had purchased the house before meeting Daphne and her name wasn't on the deed, the property remained mine. With no children in the picture, the divorce proceedings would be straightforward. Concerned about my company, I inquired about the possibility of being forced to sell it and divide the proceeds. Claudia summoned Harry to address my concerns, and he promptly assured us. Don't worry. The marriage contract clearly stipulates that your company is solely yours, and she has no claim to it. They might attempt, but I double-checked, and legally, they have no grounds. I concluded the meeting with Claudia at 12.30, handling financial matters as instructed. She took charge of the situation, assuring me that everything was under control and Daphne would be served the divorce papers at her office on Monday. Later, I replaced my damaged cell phone and spent the rest of the weekend working on the yard and catching up on my favorite TV series. Despite my lingering anger towards Daphne, I couldn't fully grasp the reality of the situation. While I anticipated grieving for the marriage eventually, at that moment, my emotions were still too intense. The prospect of Daphne returning home on Sunday loomed, and I debated whether to sleep in the guest room or relegati her to it. Ultimately, I decided that it was my house, and she had walked out on me. Refusing to share my bed with her, I moved all her belongings into the guest room. Subsequently, I purchased a new lockable doorknob and installed it on my bedroom door, keeping the key in my pocket. Upon hearing Asshole's car arrive the following evening, I activated the surveillance system to record. I observed Daphne engaging in a prolonged French kiss with her boss before exiting the car and waving as he drove away. I was seated in the living room, seemingly engrossed in a book when she entered. Hi, honey. How was your weekend? She inquired, appearing anxious. Despite her attempt to conceal it, I could discern that she wasn't as composed as she projected. I refrained from acknowledging her, maintaining my focus on my book. Fine. Continue with your sulking. Derek was spot on when he mentioned you would act this way. 
suggesting you lack the intelligence to understand my needs or the maturity to accept your shortcomings. She ascended the stairs. As she left, I began counting. One, two, three. Kenneth Morrison, what's going on? Did you put a lock on our bedroom? Correction. On my bedroom, I responded calmly. All your belongings are in the guest bedroom. You'll be staying there until you find an apartment. What the hell? Wait until I tell Derek about this. This was not part of the agreement. Agreement? What agreement? I haven't agreed to any of your partner's nonsense. Either you stay in the guest room or leave. Perhaps Kramer's wife can accommodate you in her marital bed. She glared at me, not uttering a word, stormed into the guest room, and slammed the door. I followed her upstairs, yelling through the door, Speaking of agreements, what was in it for me, by the way? No response. I returned upstairs. After fifteen minutes, my phone began buzzing with text messages from an unfamiliar number. What's this I hear, Cuck? You won't let Daphne into her own room? I thought I explained things clearly to you. Even someone like you should comprehend. For tonight, I'll overlook your childish crisis. Tomorrow, you'll prepare Daphne's favorite dinner and apologize for your behavior. If you behave the rest of the week, I'll permit her to be intimate with you next weekend. Fail to comply, and you'll discover my threats are genuine. Follow my instructions. No questions. Clear? I couldn't believe what I was reading. This person bordered on being heartless, delusional, and foolish. I chose not to respond, but took a screenshot of the conversation and sent it to Harry. Harry responded three minutes later, saying, Incredible. This guy thinks he's top-notch, but he's just a first-rate idiot. Keep the conversation intact and don't bother replying to him. Kramer continued to send a couple more acknowledgement requests, to which I remained silent. Eventually, he stopped reaching out. I didn't encounter Daphne again that evening. I went to bed, securing the door and leaving the recording system on. I messaged one of my assistants, notifying him that I would be coming in late the next day. I waited until the morning after Daphne had left before getting up and getting ready. I made myself breakfast while downloading the recordings from my system for the night. Daphne hadn't left the guest room until this morning. She had used the guest bathroom for a shower and left without having breakfast. Surprisingly, she hadn't attempted anything with my computer, as I had anticipated. A text from Claudia Milton popped up. Hi, Kenneth. Just confirming that the divorce papers will be served at Tenkodor this morning. I informed Harry as well. Have as good a day as possible, considering everything. Before heading to the shop, I ensured my home system was still recording and set to send an alert to my phone if activated. I had an 11Z meeting with the architect to discuss the final modifications for my current client. I kept myself occupied with small tasks until the meeting. I anticipated a call from Daphne shortly after being served, but it never came. At 10.45, I messaged Harry, expressing my surprise at Daphne's lack of contact. This means she's talked to Kramer about the divorce papers. They might already be scheming. I'll call Laura. Stay tuned, Harry replied. The meeting went smoothly, surprisingly allowing me to stay focused. I spent the rest of the afternoon doing maintenance on my tools and tidying up the shop. At 15.12, I received an alert on my cell phone. I texted Harry that the show was in motion. He responded with a thumbs up. I accessed my system and observed the live events unfolding in my house. Daphne had entered accompanied by an unfamiliar man. They proceeded to our home office, where they activated my computer. The two of them maintained minimal conversation. The man spent a few minutes deciphering my password, followed by inserting a flash drive into my computer and engaging in suspicious activities for around ten minutes. Fortunately, I managed to capture clear images of his face. Meanwhile, Daphne went to the guest room and packed her belongings in garbage bags, as her suitcases were apparently in the master bedroom closet. Once the man completed his tasks, he shut down the computer and informed Daphne of his departure. She finished packing and left the premises at 1556. Harry contacted me shortly after the recording ceased. All right, Kenneth, 
head home and act normally. I suspect they will involve the police tonight or tomorrow, so be prepared for an inspector's visit. Obtaining a search warrant takes a few hours, so anticipate their arrival tomorrow. Could I get arrested? I inquired. It's a possibility. If it happens, maintain silence. Don't answer any questions. I've already reached out to Stephen Lindsay, a reliable criminal defense lawyer. I've shared all pertinent information, including the recordings. He assures me this will be the easiest case of the year, Harry assured. I provided Harry with the code to control my alarm system recording in case of an arrest. After some more discussion, we concluded our conversation. I felt extremely anxious as I drove home. The evening passed without any police visits, calls from Daphne, or unpleasant messages from asshole Kramer. I made myself a sandwich and ate while watching TV. Although tempted to inform my parents about the situation, I decided to wait until the storm had passed. Explaining computer system tampering and cloud-stored videos to my mother seemed futile and likely to cause unnecessary worry. The following day, while I was at the store, I received another notification indicating that there was an intruder in my house. Following the same procedure as the previous incident, I immediately texted Harry and accessed my security system. The police had entered my residence and were attempting to deactivate the alarm. It seemed they had successfully shut down the system as communication was lost. Harry informed me that he had witnessed the events and forwarded the images to Stephen Lindsay. Approximately one hour after the police arrived at my home, two officers arrived at my shop and placed me under arrest. I was handcuffed and transported in a police car. They swiftly informed me of my rights and began asking questions, which I declined to answer. Upon reaching the police station, they confiscated my cell phone and wallet, placing me in a cell with five other individuals. There was minimal interaction, as everyone was focused on the floor tiles. After about three hours, a guard came to escort me to a meeting room where I would meet my lawyer. What the heck? I exclaimed to the guard. I never disclosed who my lawyer is. The individual remained silent, leaving me alone in the room. The door opened ten minutes later, revealing Derek Kramer with a triumphant grin as wide as the Golden Gate Bridge. He sat across from me without uttering a word. I maintained eye contact, offering no response. Once satisfied with establishing his dominance and making it clear that he considered himself victorious in this battle, he gave me a triumphant look and began speaking. Now, do you understand the gravity of the situation? I remained silent. I asked you a question, Morrison. Answer me, you insignificant bug. Once again, I refrained from responding. It will be your testimony against mine, Morrison. A carpenter's word versus one of the most prominent lawyers in the city. Can you guess the outcome? He inquired, his perpetual smirk in place. He rose from his seat. All right. It appears that you need some time to think over what I've shared with you. Let's reconvene tomorrow morning for further discussion. Maybe spending a night in this communal cell with your friends will help you gain some clarity, he stated before exiting the room. I was escorted back to the cell, where there were now only four other individuals. Later that afternoon, another person came to see me. I was brought back to the same meeting room where a tall, blonde man awaited me with a stern expression a don't-mess-with-me demeanor. He stood up as I entered. Good afternoon, Kenneth. Pleasure to meet you. I'm Stephen Lindsay. Feel free to call me Stephen. Harry contacted me earlier today, expressing difficulty reaching you. Given the circumstances, we suspected you might have been arrested and brought here. I proceeded to recount all the events of the afternoon, including the unsettling visit from Derek Kramer. Stephen's jaw visibly dropped, though he remained silent. All right, you'll be appearing before a judge tomorrow morning. Expect a substantial bail, but don't worry. Harry will handle it. I know it's going to be a tough night, but stay strong. Both Harry and I are here to support you. In the meantime, continue refusing to answer their questions. I've officially taken on your case, and I'll ensure Kramer doesn't bother you again. The next day, I faced the judge on charges of possessing illegal materials with children, 
maintaining my plea of not guilty. The bail was set at 25K, and I was released later that afternoon. While I couldn't leave the city limits or contact my soon-to-be ex-wife, Derek Kramer, or anyone from their office, I was permitted to work in my shop. My cell phone and wallet were returned to me, and Stephen took me for a late lunch where we continued our conversation. I refrained from divulging too much information at the police station yesterday due to concerns about confidentiality. However, after making some calls and conducting research, I uncovered quite a bit of intriguing information about Derek Kramer. Allow me to provide you with some reassuring details. Firstly, the process of obtaining a search warrant takes a few hours, and only afterward can they review the discovered material and secure an arrest warrant. In your case, you were brought in before they completed the search of your house. Secondly, despite restrictions on your ability to contact me or Harry, Derek Kramer was allowed to see you. These circumstances strongly suggest that the entire situation was orchestrated, which is unquestionably illegal. But Harry mentioned that Kramer has influence over many judges, I pointed out. Not all of them, he replied with a wink. You can't build so many friendships without inevitably making some enemies. I have no idea what I'll find at home. I hope my wife and her conniving partner didn't take everything. Don't worry about that. Harry went to your place right after the police left, rearmed the system, and set it to record again. No one showed up. I returned to the shop to retrieve my car and then headed home for a well-deserved and necessary shower. The architect had left a message confirming the updated plan had received client approval. This was a positive development, as it meant I could return to work the next day and divert my mind. Upon reaching home, I discovered a chaotic scene. Every inch had been searched. Besides the manipulated computer, I knew they wouldn't find anything incriminating. As I tidied up, I couldn't help but shed tears for the first time. Just a week ago, I was a content man in what I believed was a solid marriage. Now, I was a suspect in a crime, facing divorce, and manipulated by my wife's boss. What had I done to deserve this? At least there were no reporters bothering me. They were likely preoccupied with the newly uncovered multi-billion unexplained hole in public finances to care about someone like Kenneth. Towards the conclusion of the subsequent week, Stephen finally reached out to me with a significant revelation. All charges against me had been dropped. It appeared that the assigned inspector, a formidable individual particularly sensitive to issues of blackmail, was not one to be trifled with. Apparently unswayed by Kramer's maneuver, the inspector promptly ensured the filing of charges against Derek Kramer for blackmail, evidence fabrication, and possession of illegal materials with children. Daphne, on the other hand, would face accusations of conspiracy related to these crimes. Shortly after my conversation with Stephen, Harry called me, inviting me to dinner that evening. While en route to Harry's house, Claudia Milton, my family law attorney, contacted me. Kenneth, Daphne's lawyer called me this afternoon and conveyed her readiness to sign the divorce papers without alterations, with one condition. She insists on a one-hour private meeting with you, suggesting it could take place at my office. Though seeing Daphne was the last thing I desired, I reasoned that the meeting might expedite the divorce proceedings, making it a worthwhile investment of time. I instructed Claudia to proceed, agreeing to meet Daphne. The evening spent with Harry and Christine was a welcome respite, the first truly relaxing one in two weeks. Christine had prepared a delightful meal of coconut shrimp and rice. It left me feeling at peace when I returned home. The meeting with Daphne was slated for the following Wednesday, and despite being the victim in the misguided plot, I couldn't shake off the nervousness. Upon arrival, I was directed to Claudia's office, where she advised me. Kenneth, I'm unsure about her intentions, but I must caution you. There are pending criminal accusations against her. Do not provide any ammunition, avoid saying anything that could be used against you in court. We can't search her for recording devices, so be mindful that she may be recording you. Okay, thanks for the warning, I replied. I was ushered into a small private meeting room where Daphne was already seated. I anticipated encountering the same spiteful and arrogant Daphne I had known in the preceding weeks. 
However, the Daphne before me appeared to be a shattered individual. Despite feeling a surge of compassion, the vivid recollection of her questionable interaction with Kramer before their weekend getaway swiftly dispelled any positive sentiments I might have harbored. Thank you for agreeing to meet, Kenneth. What could you possibly have to say to me, Daphne, after all you've done? Her tears began to flow. Kenneth, I'm so ashamed of my actions towards you. You're an amazing husband who didn't deserve any of that. I was completely ensnared by Derek Kramer's influence. When I learned that the charges against you were dropped and he and I might face accusations, it jolted me out of that spell. I can barely face myself in the mirror and all for the most pitiful encounter. For the next 30 minutes, she continued to self-reflect, offering an impromptu analysis of her own behavior. She didn't probe me for information or ask any questions. I understand it's over between us, Kenneth. If I were in your position, I'd do the same and seek a divorce. I don't blame you for ending things. I want you to know I've resigned from my job. I made it clear to Derek Kramer that I never want to speak to him again. I returned to my parents' home and confessed everything. They're furious with me. Let's just say the atmosphere at home is anything but warm and welcoming. I gazed at her in silence. Honestly, there was no clever response to all of this. She had created her own situation, and now she had to face the consequences. The upcoming months, and perhaps even years, will be challenging for me, Kenneth. I'm uncertain about what life has in store for me. My only hope is that eventually, after everything settles, we might have the chance to be friends. That's a distant prospect, Daphne. Very distant. We'll see when we get there. Best of luck. I stood up and exited the room. A part of me still held affection for her, but a reconciliation was out of the question. Despite my initial desire for revenge, circumstances had already turned her into a miserable person. She had learned a lesson, and there was no need for further retribution. Daphne secured a plea bargain by fully cooperating with authorities against Derek Kramer, leading her to relocate to another city. I lost touch with her thereafter. When accusations against Kramer became public, two other men came forward, lodging a complaint against him for blackmail. Kramer received a 12-year jail sentence. As the police possessed recordings of all my interactions with him, my testimony wasn't required. After Kramer's conviction, I initiated a civil case against him and what remained of his firm, securing a $2 million settlement, with a significant portion going to Harry. Despite feigning outrage, I was pleased to reward Harry for his invaluable assistance. My company is thriving, and I'm in the final stages of acquiring a specialty door manufacturer, enhancing our operations. With six employees who feel like a second family, I'm content. Harry and Christine invited me to a BBQ party a few days after my divorce was finalized. It was there that I met Christine's younger sister, Kathy, and we instantly hit it off. We've been dating for a few weeks, and we'll see where life takes us. Several weeks after settling the civil case against CBH and Kramer, I visited Kramer in jail. Instructing the guard to ensure Kramer stayed for our conversation, I smirked as he walked in, opening with a taunt, What do you want, cuck? Kramer tried to leave upon seeing me, but the guard insisted he sit and listen. Ignoring his insults, I casually remarked, Oh, striking preemptively? Interesting. Heard your wife, Jessica, filed for divorce. Perhaps I should ask her out for dinner and offer her a memorable night. Enraged, Kramer responded, You bastard! If you do the- Cutting him off, I grinned. Don't waste your pathetic spit, asshole. I've already done that. The hummingbird tattoo on her upper left thigh is quite lovely, isn't it, cuck? He turned crimson, resembling a beet. Once again, he was on the verge of issuing threats. However, in the final moment, he grasped that such an approach wouldn't further his cause. Regardless, I'm not here today to discuss Jessica. I just wanted to inform you that you're a fool. A fool who needs occasional reminders of his own foolishness. Consider this. 
menacing a man in his own home, and outlining in advance the consequences if he doesn't comply with your absurd demands isn't exactly a display of intelligence, is it? Even a carpenter would recognize that. Let's say, on this occasion, you're the one left in the dust. I burst into laughter while he simmered with anger. Oh, and weren't you the one who asserted that possessing certain materials was illegal for a simple man like me, but perfectly acceptable for a powerful figure like yourself? Your power truly astounds me. I'm overwhelmed by your grandeur. Perhaps it's the jumpsuit. It suits you so well. Kramer was so infuriated that he seemed on the brink of neurological breakdown. Before I depart, I have something that both Jessica and Daphne believed you might find enlightening one day. I mentioned, handing him a folded sheet of paper. He unfolded it and scrutinized it for a few seconds. What the hell is this? he inquired. Case in point. I chuckled. This is a depiction of female genitalia, commonly referred to as a pussy. I pointed to a specific spot on the drawing. They wanted you to know that the arousal point is here.